Hello, my friends, and happy Monday. It's the beginning of another week. I've got a great week, a slate of guests planned for you on this week's Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Joining us today, the great David Rothkopf of the Daily Beast and Deep State Radio Network joins me for another great, important, enlightening conversation, and that begins right at 22 minutes into today's show. If you want to skip today's news headlines and clips, but I don't think you want to do that, folks, because I've got it all for you here and every day of the week. Tell your friends if they want a great news rundown, check out Stand Up with Pete Dominic. And I hope to see you out in Las Vegas, March 22nd and 23rd. It's the Pod Jam. Me and a whole bunch of my friends, comedians, musicians, podcasters, taping live podcasts, hanging out, going for a hike. Join us out in Las Vegas, March 22nd, 23rd. Get your tickets right there at the top of the show notes and email me with any questions for more information. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. All right. Headlines. News. Let's see what happened over the weekend. Biggest story, of course, it was the Super Bowl yesterday, last night. It was, uh, it's an American holiday and it was an amazing game. Went into overtime. The 49ers, unfortunately, came up short if you're a 49ers fan. But if you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan, unfortunately, they won. And for America, they won because, of course, Taylor Swift came out and endorsed President Biden at the end of the game, as predicted by Vivek Ramaswamy. So, <laughs> well, no, uh, this is what well, Donald Trump, though, over the weekend did try to take credit for Taylor Swift's success by uh, pointing out the fact that he passed when he was the uh, the president. He passed legislation that made it easier for artists to get royalties or something like that. I don't even know if it's true. And I don't think any president wouldn't have passed that. But nonetheless, it's a day that ends in day when a man takes credit for a woman's success. And he's clearly ter- terrified of Taylor Swift, who probably will at some point, hopefully, come out and endorse Joe Biden. But, oh, what a game in Las Vegas. Great, great game. I got to admit, I like watching football. I'm not a fanatic. I don't sit there and watch games at a time, but I I certainly loved uh, watching the Super Bowl from Las Vegas, where we will all be gathering March 22nd, 23rd. Halftime show, uh, Usher, apparently he was amazing. I don't know how to evaluate such things. I didn't really get into it, if I'm being honest, until Alicia Keys came out. Don't yell. Industry experts uh, said this year's Super Bowl, the largest betting day in American history, more than 67 people apparently betting on the game, including right-wing sports guy Clay Travis, who's a huge asshole, who said that the 49ers will win and he is never wrong. Well, he was wrong. So I think that was fun. Did you like the commercials? I liked I liked a lot of the commercials. I'm not going to lie to you. A little bit too much Jesus, but those Jesus commercials were still, they were pretty good, but I just didn't like that they ended in I was like, oh, come on. All right. Well, maybe fine. Jesus. I don't know. You know, find your own Jesus. Maybe I'll I'll really twist and turn to have those commercials come out the way I want them to promoting uh, my beliefs because they were they were well done. But there was also an RFK Jr. for president commercial playing off uh, his uncle's campaign back in the early 60s. So we'll see how that turns out for him. But that was pretty upsetting to see. It just goes, Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. And all I could hear was. Anti-vax, 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 no vaccines. And also a lot of other things that make RFK Jr. just terrible. Anyway, I enjoyed watching the game. I hope that you had a good time watching the game. And if you didn't give a shit about the game at all, well, I hope you enjoyed your Sunday evening. I'm happy to have you listening to the program. We don't really do a lot of sports here, but of course the Super Bowl is, well, the Super Bowl. Let's get to some other news from the weekend. In the Israeli-Hamas war, Israel airstrikes in Rafah and other parts of southern Gaza killed more than two dozen people. The prime minister in Israel has described the city as the enclave of Hamas stronghold. Israel's plans, according to New York Times, to expand the ground invasion into Rafah, where millions are sheltering from fighting is concerned. Aid groups and left Gazans questioning where else to go. In Russia, Russian attack on a fuel depot in Kharkiv in northeastern Ukraine, I should say Ukraine, caused homes to catch fire, killing seven people from two families. Ukraine needs to relieve exhausted troops who have been fighting for nearly two years, the New York Times says, but a potential expansion of the military draft has become a politically charged issue. They're writing about that. I asked Rothkopf about that on today's conversation. Let's see. Internationally, in Pakistan, the party of imprisoned former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan won the most seats in parliamentary elections. You think we're fucked up? Yeah, I think we're probably more fucked up than them. 
in many ways, but also not in a lot of ways. Anyway, in Hungary, their president resigned, not Viktor Orban, the prime minister, but their president uh, amid a public outcry over the pardoning of a man implicated in a sex abuse scandal at a children's home. Yeah, bad idea. What were you thinking? Pardoning that guy in Brazil. They have a dengue fever emergency. Public health experts say the outbreak could signal a coming surge in cases across the Americas. So that's great news. Looking forward to dengue fever or whatever it's pronounced. And of course, there's a huge winter storm forecast to move through the northeast this uh, early this week. Heaviest snow expected to land right around me. Love it. Pennsylvania, New York, New York, New Jersey, and uh, southern New England. John Stewart returns to The Daily Show today. Very, very exciting uh, to hear about that. Can't wait to see it. Really happy that he's back. I think it matters a lot. I'll always be proud that he hired me at The Daily Show, and I have a lot of great uh, appreciation and admiration for him, and I think he's good for America. What else can I tell you? Larry Hogan, Maryland's uh, former Republican governor and longtime Trump critic, is now running for Senate in Maryland, and that means that he's not going to be the candidate for no labels, which a lot of people were speculating about. And here's your friendly reminder, PSA, that uh, Wednesday is Valentine's Day, if that's a day that you celebrate or think about or do anything for someone that you care about or love. Maybe it's a day that's the only day that you actually show love. Anyway, Valentine's Day is Wednesday this week, so I wanted to just remind you about that so you don't get in trouble. You're welcome. The defense secretary, Lloyd Austin, has been hospitalized again just weeks after his cancer treatment now taken in apparently for a bladder issue. He's transferred his duties to his deputy this time, and I'm sure there won't be any any controversy, but that's disconcerting, obviously. And breaking news on Monday, two hostages have been rescued from Gaza in a special operation. Amazing news. They were taken 128 days ago during Hamas's October 7th attack. Apparently, a woman walked into Joel Osteen's church and began shooting on Sunday afternoon. Lakewood Church, six miles from downtown Houston. You don't see that very often, a woman uh, committing that kind of uh, violence. But apparently, she uh, entered the mega church around 2 p.m. dressed in a trench coat, armed with a long gun and a bat. Backpack, accompanied by a young child. The child was hit during the shooting and is in the hospital in critical condition, apparently. Police uh, have not shared details about a possible motive yet, what the woman's relationship to the child. One other man apparently was injured uh, with the shooting, just the latest instance of, of gun violence. Well, not even. There's probably been a lot more that hasn't been reported or since that shooting, unfortunately. But pretty crazy uh, that, that happening at Joel Osteen's church. I think Osteen responded with something about, like, there's evil in the world. Yeah, here's a statement. Our community is devastated by today's events. Grateful for the swift actions of law enforcement. May the healing hands of God touch the lives of everyone involved and provide comfort during this difficult time. And in the face of such darkness, we must hold on to our faith and remember evil will not prevail. God will guide us through the darkest of times. Ah, Well, there there you have it. There was more to it, but I'm not going to read the full thing. But that is what I've got for you in today's headlines. Got to get to some of those sound clips I always bring to the show. Well, almost always. It's a lot of work here, this new segment. I can't do it without your support. So sign up now. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. And great clip at the end. I always try to end with some jokes. And last night, the Super Bowl was on CBS. And so somehow they they got Stephen Colbert to go live. I'm sure that was part of his contract negotiation to work on a Sunday night late. He had a live audience, and it's worth hearing some of those jokes. But first, let's start with a clip I saw a lot of people sharing yesterday online. Meet the Press, Kirsten Welker had uh, former New Orleans Mayor Mitch Landro, who I know and really like and admire on. And he did not like the framing of her questions around this special prosecutor's report that we see has been concluded with no charges against the current president, Joe Biden. Unlike President Trump, which has 91 felony counts pending against him, and by the way, in over uh, all the depositions that President Trump has taken in those cases, that says he doesn't remember or doesn't know over a thousand times. So this swooning over uh, whether or not the president remembered uh, the year that his son died and, and therefore is not fit to be president is just really sad and below the belt and unnecessary. Well, just to be very clear, the report didn't say he wasn't engaged in any wrongdoing. In fact, it was quite firm in the fact that he mishandled classified documents. He just wasn't indicted and criminally charged. But let me follow up with you. The documents found in the president. Well, wait, wait, no, Chris, right. wait, let me. No, 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 no. You can't. No, no, no. I'm not going to I'm not going to accept that premise in an investigation. 
a, a special counsel determines based on the facts and the law about whether somebody engaged in criminal wrongdoing. And he found out that the president didn't. As a matter of fact, he's the only special counsel that's been engaged in this kind of activity that had to say that he could not indict somebody. And th- that is that is a fact. And so that's the big takeaway from this report from a legal perspective. Um, from a legal perspective, that is absolutely right. He said he was not going to indict Thank him. You. Let me, though, ask this question. Because which he didn't is have the law the or the facts to do it. Right. Well, right. But he did say that classified documents were mishandled and he said that national security could have right. been jeopardized. But let me let me ask you this, because y- y- the yes, documents- but, but Christian, he didn't say national security. No, ma'am. I'm sorry. He didn't say national security was compromised. And you just he you said just it heard could have from been. He said the secretary of Homeland been. Security. He, but but it was not. And the facts and the law suggested that the president was not engaged in criminal activity to be distinguished between the former president, who right now has 91 felony counts pending against him in four different cases. So let's just keep the facts right and let's let's not make false comparisons between the two, which unfortunately people do a lot of these days. Speaking of the former president. All right, there you go. And there is uh, Mitch Landrieu with a master class and and reframing the question because he didn't like the way that that it was framed. I actually did that at the Board of Education meeting. And I thank you very much for all of your kind notes after I uh, shared my comments and others at the Board of Education meeting. But a local media CBS affiliate actually interviewed me and and uh, I didn't like the question that the reporter was asking. And guess what? The reporter did not like uh, the fact that I didn't like the question. And well, needless to say, it never aired. Well, over the weekend, a disgraced former president in a rally made comments basically that he wouldn't support NATO. He let Russia walk right in because they didn't pay their dues. In this clip from CNN's Jake Tapper while interviewing Senator Marco Rubio, the hollow barrel that he is, hard to see him. You could just look right down. It's almost transparent because he has absolutely no principles. You hear that clip. So you're going to hear. Here, to my friend Tina, you're going to hear Trump's voice, and it's going to be uh, triggering in this clip, but you, you kind of have to hear the response that Marco Rubio has to it. You just pushed and got legislation to require the advice and consent of the Senate or an act of Congress before any president could suspend, terminate, or withdraw U.S. membership from NATO. So I want you to take a listen to something Donald Trump said yesterday on the campaign trail. The president of a big country stood up and said, Well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You've endorsed Donald Trump. Uh, Are you comfortable with him suggesting that he wouldn't defend NATO countries and actually he would invite Putin and Russia to invade them? Well, that's not what happened, and that's not how I view that statement. I mean, he was talking about something, a story that he talked about happened in the past. By the way, Donald Trump was president, and he didn't pull us out of NATO. You know, in fact, American troops were stationed throughout Europe as they are today. They were then as well. But he's telling a story, and frankly, look, Donald Trump is not a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He doesn't talk like a traditional politician. And uh, we've already been through this now. You'd think people had have figured it out by now. What he's basically saying is, if you, if you see the comments, he said NATO was broke or busted until he took over because people weren't paying their dues. And then he told the story about how he used leverage to get people to step up to the plate and, and become more active in NATO. He's not the first American president. In fact, virtually every American president at some point in some way has complained about other countries in NATO not doing enough. Um, you know, Trump's just the first one to express it in these terms. But I, I have zero concern because he's been president before. I know exactly what he has d- done and will do uh, with the NATO alliance. But there has to be an alliance. It's not America's defense with a, a bunch of small junior partners. Some of these are big countries with big economies. Many of them are doing more. The Germans mm-hmm. are doing a lot right now. Oh, so, man, the always reprehensible Marco Rubio yesterday on CNN with Jake Tapper. And he really let him hang himself on some other issues, too. That full interview is worth watching Okay, so now let's get to CBS where Margaret Brennan had Nikki Haley on and she asked the disgraced former president's former ambassador to the U.N. what she thought about his comments vis-a-vis NATO. If elected, would you adhere to the premise that an attack on one is an attack on all? I mean, absolutely. NATO has been a success story for the last 75 years. But what bothers me about this is don't take the side of a thug 
who kills his opponents. Don't take the side of someone who has gone in and invaded a country and half a million people have died or been wounded because of Putin. Don't take the side of someone who continues to lie. I dealt with Russia every day. The last thing we ever want to do is side with Russia. What we always need to remember is America needs to have friends. After September 10th, we needed a lot of friends. We can never get into the point where we don't need friends. Well, you need some friends because you're not going to win. You don't have enough friends and probably lost a lot of friends by the fact that you ever worked for Donald Trump. But her husband is actually in the National Guard and he's deployed Nikki Haley's husband. And over the weekend at that rally, Trump disparaged him. He's like, where is he? Where's Nikki's husband? Where is he? And so it was interesting to hear Margaret Brennan ask Nikki Haley about those comments, but also framing them in light of the comments that disgraced former president once made about John McCain before he was elected and after Nikki Haley agreed to go work for him. How is it different? I want to ask you about another comment that Donald Trump that was personal about your husband, Major Michael Haley, who is currently deployed with the South Carolina National Guard. Trump said this about you. Where's her husband? Oh, he's away. He's away. What happened to her husband? What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. I know you said this is disqualifying, but during his first presidential uh, campaign, Donald Trump mocked former POW John McCain and a Gold Star family. He was still elected. You agreed to work for him. Why do you think that's disqualifying now? Well, I agreed to serve our country, and I'm proud that I got to serve our country. Um, there's there's nothing, um, no more higher honor than to serve um, the people of this country. But what I can tell you is, look, it's just... It's insulting to military members. It's insulting to military families. And the part that bothers me is he continues to do this. This isn't personal about me and Michael. This is about what it says to every member who sacrifices for us. This is about what it says to every military family who sacrifices alongside of them. We can't have someone who sits there and mocks our men and women who are trying to protect America. Yeah, always the best point to be made and interesting to hear those who support Trump try to answer that question and they just always say, well, he didn't say those things or stop. That's nonsense. Or John McCain was an asshole and deserved to be <laughs> captured. All right. Now let's get to one of our favorite Congress people. It's uh, Jasmine Crockett from she represents a district uh, part of Dallas and Texas. We love her. She was on MSNBC over the weekend. I don't think. This needs too much of a setup. And look, while some of the GOP are battling to fund Ukraine and its fight against Russia, Donald Trump is saying he would encourage Russia to attack a NATO country if it is behind on payments to the alliance. The White House has called those comments appalling and unhinged. How do you interpret that? Um, paging E. Jean Carroll. Uh, I need her to have the same energy about her $83.3 million that he owes. Yes, absolutely. We don't stop. We just keep going and we go and get our money. Listen, this is absolutely ridiculous that we're even talking about the candidacy of a Donald Trump, someone who we know was always palling around with Russia, someone who encouraged the interference with our domestic elections in the first place. And the fact that he has not learned his lesson from losing his election from his very ridiculous and dangerous rhetoric tells us everything that we need to know. I truly don't understand how and why anyone can see that this guy is a viable candidate. We are talking about someone that literally may start World War III. It is just that deep. So for everyone that thinks that they are now an expert in foreign policy, I need you to look up what happens when we don't do what we're supposed to do for our NATO countries. If you're going to be a foreign policy expert, don't just be an expert in the Middle East. Become an expert in all of foreign policy and understand how dangerous this guy is. Yeah, and listen. Oh, man, she's always so good. She's always so, so good. Jasmine Crockett, we got to try to get her back on. I mean, she might be too big for us now, do you think? I don't know. She gets all these big, big invites to appear on media outlets all the time. I bet she'll join us. All right, now let's get to... One more clip from uh, this is Anna Navarro on The View. It's spoiler plate, but I just thought I'd toss it in. But I all, but I'm going to say this over and over again. This comes down to a binary choice. And the binary choice is Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. And Donald Trump makes as many gaffes, probably just not as much scrutiny as Joe uh, Biden does. Last week, he confused Nikki Haley for Nancy Pelosi. These are actually people he knows, right? 
and he's been working with. And so how do you uh, justify that? But it gets less scrutiny than Joe Biden. All right. Well, there you go. Anna Navarro. Everybody's talking about Joe Biden's age, including David Rothkopf on today's show. That is coming up, but not before I serve you some fresh hot comedy from CBS. It was late last night after the Super Bowl that Stephen Colbert went live with a live studio audience for jokes like this. First half did not have a lot of action. It was almost an hour into the game before we got our first glimpse of Taylor celebrating a long completion by Kansas City. But then the Chiefs immediately fumbled and Travis Kelsey was seen yelling in frustration at Coach Andy Reid. I'm a pretty good lip reader, Jimmy. Put that back up. I think he was saying, you're embarrassing me in front of my girlfriend. Jeez Louise. (laughs) Say Jeez Louise. Did I get that right? Jeez Louise. Even though her boy toy was angry, Tay-Tay still had some fun. At one point, she was caught chugging her beer on the Jumbotron. Okay. Hey, please have fun, Taylor, but please make sure you have a designated driver for your private jet. (laughs) Then the NFL tweeted her beer chug, accompanied simply with the word, icon. (laughs) If that's what makes you an icon, then... My Aunt Rita is an iconaholic. <laughs> but, uh, hi, Rita. Hey, Rita. <laughs> All right. There you go. Stephen Colbert last night. A lot more of that. He did like a 12 minute monologue. And then I think he had John Stewart on as his guest. Go check it out over at CBS. All right. Well, let's get to it. My conversation with David Rothkoff. Shall we? Yeah. You've got the news. Now let's get some original insights from the man who most recently wrote American Resistance, the inside story of how the deep state saved the nation. He's written several other books. Of course, Rothkopf is the CEO of the Rothkopf Group, which is a media company that produces podcasts, including Deep State Radio and so many more. So good. Check those out. Follow him on Twitter. He's one of my top favorite follows. He's always sharing and resharing important stuff. DJ Rothkopf. And of course, read him at the Daily Beast. He's got a new piece out regarding Biden's age titled Democrats Have to Stop Living in Denial About Biden. Age, but how to sell it basically, and we talked about that so much more with one of my favorites on a Sunday afternoon before the Super Bowl. He joined me, and I was really happy to have him. And I hope that you are as well, David Rothkopf. You are on stand up. There he is, Rothkopf. How about that game last night? Who did? What did you think of the the big win and the, and the halftime? I was behind it. I picked it. Yeah, I picked the score. Yep. I won millions. Oh, you did? Well, why are you talking to me? That's amazing. You should be out spreading yeah. cash. No. Unfortunately, you know, in a millions of, in a obscure African currency. That oh, oh, wow. It's just worth about a quarter. Oh, see. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that went sideways on you, but yeah, I'm happy to have no, you. I thought I'd I played the Forex football betting parlay and it didn't work out. Not good. Well, And nonetheless, what a game on that halftime show. Well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me after the game, apparently, here on a Monday. I am psyched to talk to you about all the things that are happening. I really want to talk to you, so I appreciate you joining me. First of all, I just have to ask you about your thoughts on the immigration deal and and, and what's happened with that. Uh, You and I have followed this issue in this country for the past 15 years, we're old enough to remember what happened when President Biden was the president with Bush was the president when it comes to immigration. But this is pretty interesting because this deal was so laden with all the things Republicans wanted on security and Democrats who progressives who care about immigration did not like it at all. And yet Republicans still shot it down. I don't understand David Rothkopf. They had well, it. Because Republicans aren't for progress. They're not in the government to govern. They're in the government to help Donald Trump win re-election. That's become their main motivation. And uh, Trump sent a message to me, said, look, solving problems doesn't work for us. Having grievances works for us. And so, you know, they did this amazing, you know, you know, I, I don't know whether it was a 180 or a 360 or something. It's certainly a, a snowboarding move because what what they did was they were, demanding that the border stuff get attached to the Ukraine and Israel aid. And then when the Democrats shocked them by actually saying, okay, they then said, well, we're going to make the terms real heavy 
And the Democrats shocked them and said, OK, again. And they all of a sudden had the strongest border security bill that the U.S. has seen in the past, I don't know, quarter century. And, you know, Trump and all of them got scared. And so they're, you know, they tried to kill the bill. You know, the, the, the most surprising story there, because that's incredibly cynical and horrible. But so far, the most surprising story there is that the Democrats, I mean, the Republicans in the Senate d- did tell Trump to go fuck himself on in terms of aid for Ukraine and Israel and have passed a couple of procedural votes that suggest that it may actually get out of the Senate, um, which ought to be a no brainer. Another thing that ought to be a no brainer. Well, then what happens when it goes to the House with all my yeah, well, probably die, probably die. You know, I mean, the reality is there's a majority in the House that would support it. But if if Johnson is capable of keeping it from going to the floor, right. It, right. it won't support it. Now, he may find some fig leaf, right? So he may find some deal where he says, OK, look, I want to deal with these things separately. Let's put the Israel vote up. Let's put the Ukraine vote up. Let's put the Taiwan vote up separately. That then goes back to the Senate, and in conference, it gets reconstituted. I don't know if that's how that works, but the you know the the reality is that the majority of people on Capitol Hill want there to be the aid bill, and the absence of the aid bill is hurting Ukraine in a very serious way right now. Yeah, I want to ask you about that because I was reading up, I was trying to catch up on the status of the war, and it's. It doesn't seem great. I mean, Zelensky just fired his top general. That guy might come out and run against him. And that creates a divide, which Ukraine, I don't know if they can afford that right now, given the fight that they're in. I I don't really understand what's happening, but I do know that we could be doing a lot more to help them. And it's a very small amount of money, much of which comes back. Our our hesitation has weakened the Ukrainian military. It's caused in fighting in Ukrainian politics. Now, I'm not saying Ukrainian politics were without problems before it, but it has been a fantastic boon for the Russians. Now, you know, the immediate knee-jerk response of MAGA world is to go, oh, Russia, 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 you're always there. You know, I, th- I, I think we need to take a, a stop a second. Ukraine aid First of all, 85% of it goes to the United States, right? Yeah. It goes to U.S. companies. Secondly, it was getting the highest return on investment of any money we've ever put into defense because we gave them a little bit of money. They destroyed half the Russian military. <laughs> and they, at the same time, defended Europe against Russian aggression, which would make Russia think twice about attacking some other country. And it has a pattern of doing that. But if we don't back them up, and Russia is able to turn this around and is able to make gains against Ukraine, it puts the rest of Europe in great jeopardy. Now, that's bad, right? Yeah. That suggests that the Republican Party is willing, perhaps inadvertently, to let Putin win. But you know, and I know, it's not inadvertent. Because this week, or last week, we saw... Tucker Carlson, your personal media hero. Yeah. Go, you know, he should be, right? You know, he's a great, great guy. I've modeled Go, myself after him. Yeah, no, I can see that. But, you know, he goes to Russia and he, you know, does an interview in which he sort of publicly fillets Vladimir Putin. Putin humiliates him anyway, which I think is is beautiful. This is what these guys do to anybody who shows weakness to them. But on the other hand, if somebody shows strength to them, they kill them. But, <laughs> they, they, you know, he goes and he does this interview. And then you go, well, wait a minute. That's two things that the, the MAGA is doing for Russia. And then yesterday or day before yesterday, depending on when you're listening to this, over the weekend, Donald Trump said, I don't care about Europe. You know, I think, you know, Putin goes into Europe and he should do whatever he wants. I don't care. You know, yeah, I'll, and, drop, I'll drop the clip in here. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's it's one of the most outrageous things. Literally, no American president 
since the Second World War, you know, would react to that with anything other than shock, disgust, and anger. Trump the idea encourage Russia to do whatever, quote, whatever the hell they want to any NATO country that doesn't pay enough in to NATO. Uh, once again, he also demonstrated his complete lack of understanding of how NATO works. There's not like some big pot. People don't put money in a pot. Countries spend a percentage of their GDP on defense. He's saying, you know, he's treating it like, well, they're not contributing to NATO. Countries don't do that. What countries do is they maintain their own strength. And, but having said that, what message does it send to Russia? I mean, this isn't, this isn't 2016 and Trump going to Russia. Russia, if you're listening, give me Hillary's emails. That's not that, you know, that's not what that is. This is Russia. If you want to invade our allies in Europe, have at it. NATO Secretary General Jean Stoltenberg, is that his name? He's former Norwegian prime minister. Jens, Jens. Jens. Of course, he's going to correct me. He said that Trump's comments about the alliance put European and American soldiers at risk. Quote, any attack on NATO will be met with a united and forceful response, he said in a statement. Any suggestion that allies will not defend each other undermines all of our security, including that of the U.S., and puts American and European soldiers at increased risk. That's the head of NATO. Yeah, and to be honest with you, I think that's an understatement. Yeah. yeah, Because all that stuff is true. But what it's not saying is this is inviting World War III. Because you know what? The, this is inviting World War Three, and it's the American taking the side of Russia, our enemy. I mean, holy shit. Holy shit. This has got to be one of those moments where if you're, your, you know, the most extreme mega nut job, you know, you've got to stop a second and think. This guy is willing to invite our enemy to attack our allies in Europe and create what could be World War III, which could lead to the destruction of all human civilization? Holy moly. You know, and we're talking about whether Biden's memory is any good? Yeah, the only the only thing I would disagree with that is that you ended it with holy moly. I mean, it was the apocalypse, and then you went soft on me. I mean, it's, it's, but I don't think you're being no. hypersolic. I don't think you're being hyper. I mean, I, I, I think that those are the stakes. Those are the stakes. It's Russia. He's, he is, Vladimir Putin has shown everybody what he wants to do. The idea that an American president, I, I can't say anything better than you can. I got to ask you about the investigation into President Biden and this guy from the DOJ who ran the investigation, who apparently is this conservative Trump or H U R is his last name. And there's a lot of afraid of pronouncing that is her, her. Yeah. I just, I said her. And then I thought somebody might think I was saying a pronoun and it's confusing if they didn't. It's his, yeah. It's his name. It's his his, his name. And he was, um, uh, uh, an official in the Trump department of justice and appointed by Trump, um, but to a senior judicial role and is a Trumper. And Merrick Garland, in all of his infinite wisdom, in order to show that he was fair and balanced, picked this loser of all people to go and investigate Biden. And then, in all of his infinite wisdom, goes against what is practice within the Department of Justice, which is you don't release reports that don't say prosecute, right? You don't release reports where you, you conclude there is no case. but. That's what this report indicated. And he released it anyway. And then you get to see the report and there's all this gratuitous. And that was the word the vice president used. It's the right word overreaching on the part of this guy who says that Biden is well-intentioned elderly man with, you know, memory difficulties and, and whatever. And first of all, doesn't belong in the report. And it, 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 it neglects to note that the interview took place on October 8th and 9th, the day after yeah. the invasion of, 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 or the attack on Israel, where as one senior White House official told me, uh, everybody was awake all night. Every, you know, it was like two days where nobody got any sleep because they were like sitting there doing that in the middle of it. 
Biden did what Trump would never do. He cooperated with the Department of Justice. Biden sat down in the middle of this four or five hours and answered a bunch of things. And this guy decides to focus in on, 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 you know, his, his gaps of memory. And, you know, it's just absurd. I mean, we have the record. You know, you can look. Biden doing a good job. Does he seem like an adult president? You know, he took a very complicated economic situation, turned it into more jobs than any first term president in history, battled inflation down by going against the advice of economists, essentially established a new approach to economics, rebuilt NATO until the Republicans started to take it apart, Mm. uh, helped defend Ukraine, you know, got the United States out of the longest war that it had ever been in passed the biggest environmental legislation in U.S. history. A huge investment in America's future. That will made an investment, fast. made an investment in infrastructure bigger than any since Eisenhower, one in technology bigger than anyone ever in our history, started investing in technology and the Chips yeah. and Science Act that would make He's us very the, old. Yeah, but right. But the, but the point is, he has the best record ever. Now, does that matter or does it matter that he forgot a a name or a date? You have a great new piece coming out titled Democrats have to stop living in denial about Biden's age. I got an advanced copy, but is this at the the Daily Beast? Is this where? And you say you can't just dismiss all concerns about the elderly president as ageist and baseless. But there are honest ways to sell him as a candidate in 2024. And you think they'll work. And I just. I want to know what they are. Let's educate. Well, there, there, there are a lot of ways to do it. But first, the first thing you got to do is stop with the denial. No, he's young. He's vigorous. Let's have him on a bicycle and let's make him walk across the football field and all yeah. this kind of shit. Yeah. It, it's terrible. It's, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't look good. He's an old guy. Okay. So, you know, you know, take a page out of, you know, the book of past presidents. Don't make him walk across an aircraft carrier. Have him seated at the desk when you start with him. Do scenes that show the acuity of his brain or his ability to compassionately interact with people up close. Distribute that on social media. Do that kind of thing. But then have an agenda that's future oriented. Own the idea of him being the patriarch. Have him say, look, the reason I'm here is to help make a world a better place for my kids and grandkids and your kids and your grandkids. And I put together a bunch of next generation leaders and I'm surrounding myself with them. And that includes Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan and Gavin Newsom in California. And it includes Maxwell Frost in Florida and includes all these kind of next generation people. And then, you know, and, and build, you know, make that your state of the union, make everything be about the future, go on offense against Trump, you know, go out and say, he's trying to take away your basic freedoms. He's going to blow up the world. He's going to do it because that's what shows vigor and vitality, right? Not bicycling around Rehoboth beach. And then, you know, if, if you want to, you know, pièce de resistance that will end the bullshit about him. You know, then own the fact that you have a great vice president who is one of the best of that young group of, of, of leaders who is there as the insurance policy, who's been at his side every single day, who is proving herself on international and domestic issues, who right now, despite all the bullshit we heard at the beginning, because people were afraid of her, they were racist or misogynist, goes to colleges across America give speeches on Roe v. Wade and, and, and senseless gun deaths and, 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 and the threat of Trumpism to standing room ova- standing room only crowds, standing ovations and, you know, elevate her. And if you're a Dem, stop with this bullshit about, oh, I don't know about Kamala. Because that's a Republican narrative, which is created right. to make people uncomfortable with an older president. If you love Kamala, if you recognize what's good about Kamala Harris and you back that up, then what you're going to do is you are going to make the president look uh, like his administration is ready for whatever happens. Sometimes I wonder if... We almost talk too much about it because maybe it doesn't matter who is running. 
It just doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It, and that's why, you know, that, that's the other reason I connected Kamala Harris. When Kamala Harris, go, go back, listen to the speeches she's been giving. When she gives speeches these days, it's about the personal freedoms that the Republicans are taking away yeah. from. Yeah. I played like three minutes of her speech the other day. Yeah, the and it's great. Yeah. It's great. She gets it. You know, I, I actually think, yeah. I actually think, you know, the narrative was, well, I don't know if she gets it. And then, you know, recently there've been a couple of stories saying she's hitting her stride. That's wrong. She gets it better than anybody else in this administration. Listen to her. She's the one who's going to drive Kids, people of color, and women to the polls. And she did it in 2020. She helped him win in some key states. And it's going to work even better here. And rather than second-guessing her Democrats, and rather than pretending that Biden isn't old, own his age, use it, and give her the support she needs. I I love that strategy. It's well thought out. I hope the White House is listening. but. I'll copy the VP on that. But I wonder, my question is, isn't there just enough to vote not for the Democrat, not for Donald Trump? Won't we just vote against Donald Trump? Won't we all just come out? I don't care. Some, who. some people will vote against Donald Trump. And, and I, and I, 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 you know, I hope that's, that's enough. But, you know, there's the, the it, you know, we remember what happened in 2016, where in three states, 70,000 votes made know, the but, difference. Yeah, but, and, but, well, well, I understand. It. But what I'm saying is, how do we make sure that the independents, enough of them, support this administration in, in, at the ticket? How do we make sure that enough young people and, young, and enough black people turn out to vote? And we can't just say Trump's bad, you know, Trump, Trump. Trump, Trump, Trump is, is not going is, is not. You, you can't take it for granted. I don't think you can. I just sometimes wonder if he just played his worst hits on, on a loop. Well, but, uh, look, did people. you watch the morning shows on Sunday? This not as much. I no. normally do. What? Yeah, yeah because if you watch the Sunday shows, there was all this shit about Biden's memory and all that bullshit. Yep. And everybody was kind of like, and, you know, oh, yeah. And Trump said, let's start World War Three. Right. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, let's, you know, and, 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 uh, right. and, and we are so numb to this stuff right? Um, that you've got to assume that it's not getting reported in the Fox side of the media bubble. Right. And that there are a lot of people who are just not paying attention. I listened to a very smart guy at a dinner I was at last week talk about, you know, going out and he was in Michigan or something and he was going to have a smoke and there were two young kids there. And he was talking to them and they said, well, Biden, you know, you're not going to tell us to vote for him, right? Because Gaza. And 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 he was like, well, Trump's much worse. And and they and they were like, yeah, so maybe we'll set this out. And and, you know, the guy said, look, this is what the Democrats have got to contend with. It's not just Biden versus Trump. It's Biden versus the couch. Right. It's Biden versus people who aren't going to get up and get out and do it. How much data is there? Or have you seen or have you heard about that? That's an anecdote that you're telling us about these these guys. But but like of young black voters being motivated to vote or not vote at all because of the, the Middle East and almost 30,000 dead Palestinians. I, I, I have been inundated with anecdotes. Yeah. And and. You know, da- data is not the plural of anecdotes, right? It's so, I just don't know. And, and I just, I just don't have the data. But, yeah. but, but I, I get the impression that this is a serious issue. And Biden has gone, and his team have gone up to Michigan to Dearborn and so forth. And the the response has been bad. And that's why it's super important to frame the stakes appropriately for these people, because yeah, you know yeah. another thing. You're talking about Arab and Muslim Americans in that part of Michigan. Yeah. 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 And, you know, another thing we had this weekend is like Stephen Miller saying, hey, we're going to put them, we're going to use the military or we're going to use local military like groups. God knows what the fuck that means. And put, put them, put immigrants in internment camps starting day one. Now, where are you on that? Internment camps? 
Yeah, in general, and then specifically. Should, should, should we have internment camps? That's a great question, Pete. Thank you. I would I'm say, I guess, I guess, having thought about it, I'm I'm kind of against okay concentration camps in the United States of America. I'm but I don't know. Do you have another position? Are you taking the pro internment camp? Uh, position there are i i'm i'm pro internment camp if i get to decide who goes and it wouldn't be based on anything but people i specifically know like several people that i know specifically i would yeah, like i'll to tell you something i'll tell you something we're joking around here i assume and and to be honest i really hope we're joking around here but there is a non zero possibility that a year from now somebody knocks at your door and says, I don't like what you've been saying about Trump. I'm shutting down your podcast and I'm taking you to a camp. And and you may think that's insane, but this is what they're talking about. They're actively talking about taking media critics and silencing them. This is what Putin does. This is what these folks do. And I think people in the United States need to really, it really requires a leap of imagination because we've never had that. I we need to think 12 months ahead and say, what world would we be in if the nice family across the street, because they're immigrants, is thrown into a concentration camp by a bunch of armed guys who are not actually law enforcement officers, by a president and administration who are ignoring the law and the courts because they know no one will enforce them? And then that nice guy, Pete, who was at the school board meeting this week, is dragged out of his house because he was critical of Trump. And we never saw Pete again because that's what happens in Russia. And, you know, people say, oh, that's not going to happen here. That's what they're saying is going to happen. I think the only part about that that wouldn't happen is that I would be back. Like as they're dragging me out, I would probably I would whisper I'll be back or special set of skills or something. I would somehow find a way to return. You would, because you're like the Liam Neeson of podcasting. Exactly. Yes. You know, Liam Neeson, first of all, is like 126 years old. He's, I mean, I don't even know. This is one of the things of Hollywood sex. 7,000 movies, all derivative of him playing the same movie. I have a special (laughs) set of skills. And he goes out and he kills a bunch of people half his age, unfitter than him. And... You know, I mean, this is like, you know, this is like boomer porn, right? Yeah, he gives a it's lot like, of. Oh, I could do that. A lot of Liam older, did it. A lot of older male actors gives a lot of hope for that career. Yeah, no, I'm. I, I take you seriously. Obviously, that you said there's a non-zero chance, and I think that's a, a fair statement. I mean, I I think that we should all be obviously concerned and as well as active. That's why. But I also refuse to, you know. Change, change my ways. I'm going to keep talking on, on the show and at the school board meetings and, and wherever I can because. Well, you're a hero, man. I'm a hero. I'm, I'm like Prince Robin. Tear to my, yeah. You're like who? Robin. Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin. A lot of people think I'm Robin. Like, who's Batman? Who's your Batman? Um, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Ellie Mistal? Ellie Mistal. Can he be? He probably. He's the guy. I know he's good at video gaming. Well, I guess I have to let you go. Is there anything else that we wanted to, that you wanted to bring up? It's time. Mean, time. Other than World War Three and the collapse of civilization in the United States? Nope, that covers it. Okay. Well, then put a bow on that and we will reconnect very soon as I always want to with you. And we'll be listening to Deep State Radio this week. Anything big coming up? You know, I like the it. DSR yeah, network. I the DSR network has all sorts of stuff. A little later this week, we're going to launch a new website at the DSR network.com, which has all, I think we do 15 podcasts a week now. And we've got more coming. So how's that Greg Sargent podcast? I still haven't heard it. It's, it's good. He so talks close. to good people, really yeah. good people. And he's a real serious journalist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, most of our podcasts are really expert driven, expert conversations and stuff. He gets experts, but he really grills them. And I give him a lot of credit for that because yeah, I yeah. am not a journalist. I am just a Jew from New Jersey. Well, yeah, but you always put up with my strong grillings. Yeah. 
really, I really, that's tough. It's, uh, it's an intellectual gauntlet. You're like, is this a shed or a sauna? This is hot in here. It's a real intellectual gauntlet. Ah, oh, that sounds like a good name for a show. All right. I want to go launch the intellectual gauntlet. It, w- it will not be that, but I'll try to dress it up that way. Thanks for inviting me back. See you soon. All right, bud. All right, there he goes. David Rothkopf, Deep State Radio. Go subscribe. Go read him at the Daily Beast. Follow him on Twitter. Let him know that you heard him here on Stand Up. And thank you, Bumblebees, for listening all the way to the end. I love you. I hope to see a lot of you in Las Vegas. I hope to see you this Thursday night at our hangout. I can't thank you enough for listening and sharing and being in my world. I hope you have an excellent Monday, a great start to your weekend. I hope to hear from you soon. Stand up Pete at gmail.com. As always, love you guys. John Carroll, take us out. Thank you. When you're tired of begging, saying pretty please, that's the time you gotta finally get up on your knees. When you can't see the forest for the burning trees, you got to stand up. Hey, you've been sitting so long, you got the creaky knees, you got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels in a leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. There's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep in sight. We got to open up the window to let in some light. You got to stand up. That's right. We got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eye. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear when all you hear is a lie. Up off of your butt, down off of your fence, and even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense, and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, oh, you better stand up. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans for a stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try Rise up Show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide It says stand up